I'd say if there are any spouses that want to go on the tea and tour, they will be leaving from the downstairs lobby by the revolving door. They should be down there at 1120. And if they're not signed up, they can sign up at the registration desk outside. All the breaks will be held upstairs. And we have a number of exhibitors up there. And uh, they've given us support, so let's make sure we give them our support. Make sure you each have uh, two meal tickets, one for today and one for tomorrow. Make sure you hold on to those. Those will be collected at lunch. Today is a buffet. Uh, tomorrow is a sit-down meal. It's a lunch and learn. And there will be sign up at uh, lunchtime today for the uh, lunch and learn tables. You will be getting AGD credit for those of you who need that or want that. Uh, and that will take place tomorrow afternoon. We'll have everything set up for that. This afternoon, uh, we're having breakout rooms. And the information on those uh, breakout rooms is on the bulletin board that will be out in the lobby. So that will tell you where, where to go, what rooms. So make sure you look at that uh, sometime this morning. Tomorrow evening, we have a banquet. It's usually a very nice affair. And this one is not going to be any exception. We're going to have some entertainment, and I'd encourage you to sign up for that. I guess my staff is still out at the registration desk. I'll uh, introduce them at some time later. And my wife, Mona, who helped put everything together, who really did just about everything single-handed, uh, is out there. At some point, I want to bring her up. Right now, I'd like to turn the meeting over to our El Presidente, Richard Fisher. If anybody has any problems or needs anything, please come and see me. My name's uh, Mark Breiner. OK, thank you. Thank you. As, as Mark said, if you have any problems, see him. If you have any compliments, come see me about those. Um, I want to welcome you uh, also all to Philadelphia. And uh, I would want to make one uh, thing before we get going, uh, say one thing. Um, are there any of you here who uh, have become members of the Academy within the last six months or who are not yet members of the Academy? Would you just please stand for a moment? Great. Thank you. I, uh, stay, stay up for just a second. Would the members please take a look? And I want to make sure that all of these people are talked to uh, and welcomed. No, no, I don't mean that in that way. I want to make sure that these people are all welcomed uh, to, and feel the same kind of uh, affection and gratitude for their being here that we all felt when we first came. So thank you. Um, I, I also wanted to thank uh, Mark and Mona. I think this is just a beautiful facility, and uh, I want to thank them for putting this all together. Um, I don't know how many of you, uh, have you ever felt heavier pillows in your rooms? I mean, the pillows are about eight or 10 pounds at least each. And I particularly love, you know, in the commode, in the, in the bathroom, that little water fountain next to the commode. It's real set down real low. Uh, it's hard to bend over and drink out of that thing. But Oh, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> we have a very uh, exciting, am I talking into this one? Yeah. OK. I think we have a very exciting program over the next two days. And uh, starting it off, uh, we have uh, our first speaker really is, I think, something very special for the Academy. Most of you know uh, Murray Demi. Uh, most everyone here knows uh, Dr. Murray Vimy, who was the founder and the first president of the Academy. Uh, Dr. Israel Kleinberg was Murray's mentor in school, so we're, it's a special privilege to have him here. Um, I'm just going to make a few highlights. His abbreviated CV is about three pages. Uh, the whole big one we couldn't forklift into here, but 
uh, Dr. Kleinberg uh, received his uh, DDS from the University of Toronto and his PhD in biochemistry and physiology from the University of Durham in Durham, England. He is currently professor and chairman of the Department of Oral Biology and Pathology at the School of Dental Medicine at the State University of New York in Stony Brook. His honors go on and on, but in, they include the Canada Centennial Med Medal by the Government of Canada, uh, many, many teaching, order, uh, teaching honors. Uh, he has continuously been given uh, research grants from the National Institute of Health, Health and Welfare Canada, and a variety of other governmental and private funds. Um, he's been uh, published over 280 publications, original articles, books, chapters, abstracts, and so forth, holds over 40 patents. Um, he is actually what you would have to term as the father of oral biology. He uh, was the first, developed the first PhD program in oral pathology, or oral biology rather, and was the co-founder of the American Association of Oral Biologists and one of its first presidents. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Israel Kleinberg. using the podium mic probably. Okay. Or, yeah, yeah. Either, okay. either or on the podium mic. Either or this one on the podium mic or this. It's all right. <clears throat> Is okay for you? This would be all right, sure. Okay. Lights, do you want these down quite a bit or? Um, yeah, they should come down a bit. And as far as changing slides are concerned, could I have somebody, and I'll just call, call them for change or I'll change them here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. That very nice introduction, I sometimes wonder whether or not I should quit while I'm ahead. Um, first of all, let me say, indeed, it's a pleasure to come and speak to your group again. The last time <coughs> was in... Oh, okay. The last time... Is that better? Okay. Um, the last time I spoke to your group was in 1986 in New York City. The group was a smaller group, and from what I understand, it's grown very substantially. And uh, on that, uh, you have my congratulations, and I hope it grows even more. Uh, by the time I get through, you'll see that uh, some of the objectives that we have coming from the bottom end, from the basic sciences, is uh, quite similar to many of your own objectives, which uh, includes <clears throat> some of that, but trying to get at things from the other end, particularly clinically. Now, what I'm going to try to cover today is the following. I'm going to take you through some of the science that underlies the area of putrefaction, oral putrefaction, what it is, and <clears throat> the fact that oral malodor and gingivitis periodontitis is really uh, uh, results of that particular underlying biological process that takes place in the mouth. After I've done that, what I'm then going to try to do is make you aware of a fairly substantial amount of diagnostic technology that has been developed and is being developed in order to monitor and be able to apply clinically what's going on. And then finally, just a final message, which I think should fit in with some of the objectives of this organization and the organization which I'm involved a lot in, which is the American Association of Oral Biology. <clears throat> so having said that, my first slide here, as you can see, is putrefaction. Okay. 
next slide tells us that oral putrefaction is the common factor in oral malodor and periodontitis. And what basically is putrefaction? <clears throat> it basically consists of two fundamental processes. One is proteolysis, and the other is aminolysis, which is really a continuum of the same overall process, and the overall process is the putrefaction. If we start off with proteins and peptides, and these get degraded to amino acids, and then the amino acids get broken down, we then get various end products. The degradation of the proteins and the peptides, etc., is a common process that takes place, especially when bacteria get to work on these particular compounds. And the products, a number of them are odoriferous, they're volatile, and that is why oral malodor is tied in with the breakdown of proteins and peptides, which is really what is a key, uh, a, a key process that takes place in periodontitis and gingivitis. What happened? Something happened which just didn't. Could you? to cover that if we can just get going again. Hmm? Yes, the, the indole and skeletal comes from tryptophan. I keep forgetting, I'm sorry. Indole and skeletal comes from tryptophan. And that's one of the amino acids that gets broken down and will contribute to that malodor, uh, which I'll cover if we can get going. If there are any other questions, let's, uh, you could ask them and we'll at least Anyone else have any questions? Yes. Um, there's a lot appears to be going on in the dental magazines about uh, oral malodor, malodor and Correct. dentists who are using devices to measure the sulfur compound. Correct. Compression got involved with that. Correct. Are you going to address that? Uh, I'm going to address the uh, the methods. I'm going to address the mechanisms, and specifically, what you're talking about is chlorine dioxide, and uh, there are special tests that we have developed, and chlorine dioxide is of very limited benefit. Uh, hydrogen peroxide will do as well, but what you find actually is that uh, it's uh, zinc that, is, uh, that has a, a greater benefit, but the peroxide can have some. But chlorine dioxide is not the, by itself, is not uh, going to give you the whole answer. But I will cover some of that. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know about the origin of um, mouth odor and decay coming from the GI tract and how is that affected by what's going on in the mouth at the same time or is it sometimes just the GI tract problem? Uh, the, there's been a belief that the GI tract contributes a significant amount to all malod well, to, to halitosis. But basically, the contribution is small. It's more, more of it comes from the mouth. The, the, the largest portion is from the mouth of halitosis. But there are contributions, some from the stomach, but a lot from the respiratory uh, apparatus. OK. Are we? OK. I, I wonder if uh, someone will change the slides for me, and then maybe I won't screw something up here, just in case I did that. All right? OK. Now, because dental plaque is a continuous culture, it's a continuous culture of mixed bacteria, what you have is continual buildup. And that's the reason why you have to continually brush and carry out hygiene. Okay? And this gives you an idea of the rate of buildup. Along the x-axis, you can see the age of the plaque. 
Here it's in dry weight, but here's the actual thickness. And as you can see, the thickness is relatively small. And it's usually at about a couple of days of accumulation that you get some very significant changes that really start causing problems. And so you're talking about uh, thicknesses of only a fraction of a millimeter. I want to just take you through some of the events associated with dental plaque accumulation. Um, reasonably clean teeth, stop brushing, and you'll end up accumulating plaque and, of course, gingivitis. Stop brushing over long periods of time or be unable to reach uh, certain sites. And, of course, as you can see, there is the breakdown of bone. Okay? That's the typical clinical kind of situation that, uh, that you're all aware of. Now, this whole pro process of allowing plaque to accumulate and then seeing what happens has led to what has been called the experimental gingivitis model. And it essentially is just that. You clean the teeth, clean the plaque, get the gingiva in as, as good shape as possible, and then have the subject stop brushing and then see what transpires. And when you do this, then there's certain things that happen. Here's the period of cleanup, and then here's where one starts with the process of allowing the plaque to accumulate. And what, of course, happens is plaque immediately accumulates. And then you see the formation of gingival curvicular fluid happens very quickly because it is one of the indices, very early indices, of gingival inflammation. And then with time, gradually, you start to see changes in the gingiva, the appearance of the gingivae. And then with time, if this is your pocket depth, eventually, and this has been done predominantly in the animals, is that what happens, of course, is you get loss of attachment and the increase in pocket depth. And when you look at the microbial changes associated with uh, this uh, uh, allowing of plaque to accumulate, what you see is during the first couple of days, it's predominantly a gram-positive coccyte rods. And then there are some gram-negatives, the ones that are not too harmful, like the Neisseria and some of the Haemophilus. <clears throat> and then as soon as you get beyond that, into like three days or so, three to four days, now you start seeing the fusobacteria, very important with regard to the oral malodor, and you start seeing filaments and so forth. And then with time, you start getting the really more stricter uh, gram-negative anaerobes. It's really the gram-negatives, and particularly the anaerobes, that are really the culprits that are involved in oral putrefaction. So as the plaque accumulates, its microbial composition shifts. And it does so in a way that it's a more complex flora, it's more gram-negative, and it's more anaerobic. And this is one of the most important things that has come out of uh, these kind of experiments with the uh, experimental gingivitis model. Now, when the microbial composition of the microbial community as a whole changes, now we see the metabolism of that whole community changes. And that's when you start to see the kind of changes that uh, are harmful. Now, this is the system setup that we see in the mouth. And here we have central are these all microbial communities, dental plaque, whatever you want to call them, and so forth, which cover both the hard and soft tissues of the mouth. We have the diet providing some substrates. The crucial thing here is the carbohydrate. The proteins, believe it or not, except where they get stuck between teeth and so forth, don't make a big contribution or do the lipids. It's carbohydrate that is the crucial one there, and, and you're all familiar with excessive carbohydrate and the carry story and so forth. And in turn, what, what the mi microbes produce is what, of course, tax, tax the hard and soft tissues. Tax the hard tissues, you're well aware it's caries, sensitive teeth, etc. Soft tissues, of course, gingivitis, periodontitis. Okay? Now, saliva has a major influence on what transpires. And once you start to get a bit of inflammation and you start to get the formation of the curricular fluid, then curricular fluid has an influence. Okay? So that's the system set up that you have in the mouth. Now here is the clinical condition that you have, which is namely that if the clinician uses his eyeballs basically to see what's going on with regard to the soft tissues, basically 
the clinician does not see problems until the site of primary site of the inflammatory process, which is down in the crevice, does not see it until it has spread and has affected the gingival margin and so forth. And by that time, something of the order of 70% or more of the collagen, which is the main protein of the, uh, that you have present there, is destroyed. And actually, the clinical indice, namely of the usual sort of inspection with your eyes and so forth, is really looking at a fairly late condition. And the reason for getting into the whole area of cravicular fluid is simply because one cannot see down into that area. And this is a reminder that saliva and gingival cravicular fluid are the main oral ecological fluids for the mic microbes. Now, what is it that triggers or helps bring about this change in the microbes and in ultimately the change in the biochemistry there? And it is the following. When one allows the plaque to accumulate, what one sees is that the oxygen level, which is fairly low because the surface bacteria really use oxygen very quickly, and we see that by about three days, the oxygen level is essentially anaerobic, it's zero. So you see that as plaque accumulates and gets a little thicker, now what we have is this situation. What we have here, here's the tissue surface, here is a mature, full-blown plaque, and here is the saliva. Now, when the tooth surface is clean, you, of course, you don't have any plaque. When you have a little bit of plaque, you have just a little bit of this stuff here, which is really the portion of the plaque that there's enough salivary oxygen to get to. So you essentially have an aerobic plaque, and that favors mostly the gram-positive bacteria, which are not harmful at all to the soft tissues. They cause no damage, or virtually no damage. But as the plaque accumulates and the plaque gets thicker, now one finds that as the oxygen starts to come into the plaque, the outer bacteria, they get the first feeding, they remove the oxygen, and you end up with an anaerobic zone. And as a result of that, you now can get the accumulation of the kinds of bacteria that cause the harm to the soft tissues, the gram-negative anaerobes. Okay? And what that does, it changes the metabolism. I'm not going to go th uh, through it except just simply to say that what happens is that it changes the mix of the amines and the organic acids and so forth that you get from the salivary nitrogenous substrates. And when it comes to the carbohydrates and so forth, the kinds of acids change. You get acids that are a little stronger and it's a little more prone to the Kerry's picture. So the metabolism changes when the mix of the microbes change. Now this demonstrates another thing that happens when the plaque accumulates. And that's what you see along here again. And what you find is, as I mentioned before, there's change in the bacteria. And here you can see violinella, which is a gram-negative, increases. And the fusobacteria, which is associated with the putrefaction and with the, <coughs> and, and with the malodor, as well as P. gingivalis and all these others and so forth, that changes. But more important from a biochemical standpoint is we see a drop in the EH. The EH is essentially the concentration of electrons. It means that if this goes down, we are getting a more reduced condition. And that is crucial for putrefaction. If you get a lower EH, that turns on the uh, whole putrefactive process, the malodor process, and the perio process. And, I, and I'm going to have a fair bit to say about that a little bit later. Okay. And with the thickening of the plaque, and again, here we have days again, and here's neutrality. With the thickening of the plaque, what one finds is that there is an increase in the bacteria that are able to use urea from saliva, and that increases the ability of the pH to go up. And similarly, because there's generally more plaque, there's also an increase in the gram positive. They're not just totally eliminated and go away. And what happens is that we introduce carbohydrate, one finds that you can go to a lower pH. This is where you start off with, with very little change in pH when you have no plaque. So the range that the plaque can cover increases as the plaque thickens, which means it's more prone at this end for calculus, more prone for periodontal disease, 
And at this end, it's more prone for cavities. So the key biochemical process that are seen during dental plaque regrowth experiments, and that's essentially what these experiments are, is oxygen depletion, reduction in the EH, and a greater ability to raise the pH with urea, and a greater ability to lower the pH with fermentable sugars. So it's no surprise that if you let plaque accumulate, or if you don't brush one's teeth, or if one can't get to sites like interproximal sites where plaque is basically thick, why you have problems. Okay. Now, let me say a little bit about halitosis. First of all, the definition. Halos is supposed to be breath, and tosis is the condition of, of, uh, of an unfavorable breath or of the breath. And this is the general term that's used for the malodor that comes not just from the mouth, but from the respiratory tract and the stomach, etc. Anything that contributes to the odorous or odoriferous substances that one finds in the breath. But the bulk of it, the bulk of it, let me get us some better sound here. And have you speak right into that one and let's pull this one off. Okay. So I've got to try that one. All right. Is that better? Oh, boy. You mean, you mean to tell me I went through all that with. Hmm? Well, that's a compliment if you ask me to start over. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now the causes of oral malodor. Firstly, oral malodor basically is responsible, or the sources of the odor coming from the mouth is responsible for 80% or something like that of halitosis. So essentially, if you take care of the oral sources and that side of it, if there still is odor remaining, then one looks for these other, other possibilities. Anyway, let's, let me take you through this. There's a classical experiment that's done with whole saliva in oral malodor production. Whole saliva is just simply where you just spit into a tube, okay? And here's what happens when you spit into a tube. First of all, if it's just ordinary resting saliva, then it's a fairly clear fluid with a little bit of foam on it. And that's with resting saliva. But if you chew something inert like paraffin wax, what you end up with is obviously more saliva, but it tends to be cloudy. And the reason for the cloudiness is the fact that the, the, the chewing causes the um, release, or whatever you want to call it, from the oral surfaces of the epithelial squames on which there's lots of bacteria. There's a lot of free bacteria that get released, but you end up essentially with a lot of bacteria there. And that becomes a simple system to do a lot of studies. And believe it or not, that was the basis of the experiments that Miller did way, way back that laid the foundation for dental caries. And is also the simple system that laid the foundation for oral malodor. Anyway, if you now take this, this saliva that you've collected and carry out the so-called classic experiment, and what do you do? You just simply take that spit, divide it in two, okay? And the one half you add some glucose, the other half you add nothing, okay? Okay, so here you add glucose, nothing. And then put it in an incubator or put it on a warm windowsill and just leave it four hours to 24 hours. And here's what you'll see. On this side, where you put glucose, you get an acid pH. If you look at the bacteria, you'll see there's an increase in the gram positives and absolutely no odor. It's actually even may even be a bit sweet. On this side, you get an alkaline pH, more gram negatives, and the odor is uh, pretty intense. Okay? And if you want to put uh, this uh, on a diagram and do it measured quantitatively, this is what you see. Here's the time along here. Here's the pH. No glucose, the pH goes up. With the glucose, the pH goes down very significantly. If you smell the, the head space, you see it's quite substantial where there's no glucose, and where you've added glucose, no odor. So one sees that sugar, on the one hand, seems to make a difference. And the sugar makes the difference largely because it lowers the pH. And acidic pH tends to inhibit malodor in contrast to alkaline pH favoring it. Now, the question then becomes, what's the contribution to malodor production 
if you take a look at the bacterial portion, which we call the salivary sediment, and the supernatant portion, which you get by just simply centrifuging that whole saliva, what's the contribution to the malodor? And what happens if you put the two back together again? Well, here's what happens. The bacteria by themselves will give you some odor. There's enough substrate around there to give you some odor. This, without the bacteria, gives you zero odor. But this, with the supernatant added, gives you tremendous odor. And this is how one has gotten to learn the fact that saliva contains the crucial ingredients that are important to malodor production. On the basis of this, I'll have something to say about it a little later. So now the question becomes, what is it in the saliva that's responsible? Um, I said I was going to say it later, but I can say some of it now. Um, and after a whole series of fractionation experiments, it became obvious that the ultimate was the amino acids. Now, if you look at saliva, what you find is there, there isn't too much free amino acids, so it has to, become, it has to come from the proteins and the peptides. And the free amino acids are the ultimate substrates. So the question is, which bacteria that you find in the mouth and which of the amino acids are responsible? Okay. So let me take you through what we call a metabolic function grid. Sounds good. I see a hand up. How do you measure that odor? I, I can't. I'm going to come to that. I'll cover that for you, OK? All right, there, there's a couple of ways, simple methods, and then there's an instru instrumentation. All right, good. OK, now let me take you through what we call a metabolic function grid. It's a fancy name for just simply putting a bunch of bacteria along here and all of the common amino acids along here, and then seeing what happens with time. This is the results at time zero, and seeing with time whether or not the combinations will give you odor. And what you find is essentially when you start off, there's no odor with the gram positives. There's a little bit inherent odor with a couple of, of the gram negatives. And here is just simply the scale, which is if there's no odor, it's nice and clear. And going where there's lots of odor, very extreme odor, is black. So it's progressively going from uh, an index of 0 to 1 of 4. And here is after about an hour. And you can see, you're starting to see the forming up here of some darkening. And then here's after four hours, you see, not too much up here, but look what's happening here. And then here's after 24 hours, very little up here, and look at the darkening here. And what emerges, essentially, is that the gram positives contribute essentially nothing to oral malodor. And the sum of the gram negatives don't contribute much to the, the more aerobic gram negatives don't, like the Neisseria. But then you find certain other of the gram negatives do contribute. And then you notice that there's certain amino acids where you start to get the malodor. And these turn out to be just a relative handful. And what are they? Here are the main acids that are involved in, oral, in the odor formation. They're the sulfur-containing group. They're a major, major component. And they are cysteine. I like to call it double cysteine, so there isn't the confusion of whether you're saying cysteine or cysteine or so forth, and methionine. Okay? So those are the, the three that come into the sulfur-containing category. And then we have basic amino acids, arginine and ornithine. Arginine is a bit, it's more ornithine. Some think there's some cadaverine, but we found that there isn't a lot from that. And then the other is tryptophan, and this was the question that was asked here before. So these are essentially the amino acids. So up from, up from this metabolic function grid, what we're able to identify is which bugs, which amino acids, which is kind of nice because now one can zero in on things. Now, double cysteine will give you single cysteine. And then the main end product it gives is hydrogen sulfide. Very volatile, and you're all reasonably familiar with the smell of hydrogen sulfide. Now, methionine gives you methyl mercaptan. Okay? And that also has a smell. It's more of a cabbagey kind of a smell. <clears throat> now, I'm going to say something about this a little bit later. Besides the fact that they're indices of the 
putrefaction process. And there is the unfavorable social aspects of the oral malodor. These are also very powerful substances in penetrating through membranes and opening up some of the mucosal tissues, whether it's cravicular epithelium or whatever the case may be for penetration of some of the other substances that bacteria produce, such as uh, toxins and so forth. And then as far as uh, tryptophan is concerned, it produces indole and skatol. Now, of the two, indole is not too bad. Skatol, you only need little bits of it, and it is quite profound. So it's quite marked. And then as far as the uh, ornithine, that'll give you a little bit of putrescine. Uh, but basically, what usually happens is that it gets further broken down, and you end up getting some contribution by the organic acids. So you mix in oral malodor, and in a sense, we sometimes refer to it as, the, as a cocktail. Um, and the cocktail consists of products that come from the sulfur-containing amino acids, from tryptophan, and then some of the organic acids and possibly a bit of amines that will come from uh, things like um, uh, ornithine and possibly a few of the others, but to a minor degree. So it's that mix which gives the, the, uh, the variations that you see when it comes to malodor. Now, what's the relationship to the malodor to gingivitis periodontitis? And there's been a fair bit of studies related to determining what this is. One of the first was, has been to see what's the relationship to gingival inflammation. And along here, you have different levels of gingival inflammation, called the gingival index, going from least to most. And here, what you see is this is the cravicular fluid, which is a very sensitive index, a very good index of gingival inflammation. And then here's the hydrogen sulfide relationship. Um, and the correlation is pretty good. And then if you take the bleeding index and you look at some of the sulfur that's present in the air, you can see that with bleeding index increase, you get uh, a good correlation. If you look at pocket depth to the disulfide content, this is some of the disulfides that you see present in the saliva and so forth. Again, there's a pretty good correlation. And here is if you do, again, some probing, and this is the ratio of methyl mercaptan to hydrogen sulfide, it, it seems that the uh, pockets tend to contribute more methyl mercaptan than, does, uh, than it does hydrogen sulfide. The tongue does the reverse. The tongue is a very good source. The dorsum of the tongue, particularly towards the back, is a very good source of a lot of the um, odoriferous compounds. And here, this shows uh, how much volatile sulfur compounds, that's both the hydrogen sulfide and the methyl mercaptan together, and how much do you get from the coatings on the tongue uh, in relationship to the amount of tongue coating. And here you have two groups of, of, um, of subjects where, in one case, there's pockets less than four millimeters, and the other where the pockets are greater than four millimeters. And then this is the amount, the wet weight in milligrams of the amount of coating. And here it's 14.6 as compared to 90.1. In other words, this has sort of been the general impression that people who have more malodor also have more perio tend to have more um, plaque, tend to have more uh, oral uh, 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 salivary sediment. And then if you look at the volatile sulfur, you can see here's 4.3, 18.6. It's quite a difference. And if you look at the ratio, the ratio tends to be a little higher, in fact, significantly higher uh, when we look at that. Um, and then there's been a fair bit of studies looking at what do the volatile sulfur compounds do to the tissues? And this is just a list of some of the things. It increases the permeability of the oral mucosa. It increases the penetration of prostaglandin um, uh, and endotoxin. It is an increase in the solubility of collagen. It increases its degradation, suppression of DNA synthesis, suppression of protein transport, and so on and so forth. In other words, it isn't just that that one has the oral malodor. But these compounds, if they're in significant levels, <coughs> will attack the tissues. It makes it easier for the substances that gets more attention, like the endotoxins and so forth, they get more attention in the whole process, 
but the initial and primary steps is compounds such as this. And that's why they're good indices that something is going on, that the oral putrefaction process is high. And it's a, a fairly early indicator and very important when it comes to diagnostics. Now, what is very uh, also very important is the drop in the EH. And that has to take place for this to go on and for this to go on. And let me just show you some data where we see the relationship of the EH changes to plaque formation and gingivitis periodontitis. The plaque formation is the kind of reformation um, experiments that I uh, went through right at the very, very beginning. And this comes from um, some data, 1969 by Kenny and Ash. And if you think that some of the things that your organization um, uh, has difficulty in convincing uh, the conventional wisdom about changes, I've got news for you. Here's something that's been known for quite a few years. And it's only now that finally there's some ten attention being paid to it. And if you want another example is Stefan was the one who showed way back in the 1940s that if you introduce sugars um, into the mouth, you get a pH drop. And the plaque pH drops to levels that are harmful. And I think it was 1956 that we showed that when you, use, when you stimulate saliva, you can bring that back. You're just getting it now in television with gum that you can bring the pH back. So um, I don't want to discourage you, but it takes a little while to change conventional wisdom. So I don't know if I should have interjected that here, but just to tell you that uh, some of these things, for some reason, take a long time. Um, now, uh, this is the measurement of the EH, or the oxidation reduction potential, uh, where you have plaque develop. And here you see 0, uh, 2, 3, and 7 days. And here's the redox potential, which is positive of a couple of hundred millivolts. And then you see it drops to minus about 140. And here's the flora changes that I mentioned before. So as the plaque accumulates, the EH drops. But here's what is very interesting, and that is, how does that relate to perio? And here's what you see. Here's subjects with periodontal disease. Here's a control group. Within the subjects with periodontal disease, you have those, you have sites where there's periodontal pockets and sites where there aren't pockets. And if you then go ahead and measure in this group what the EH level is, you find it's got an average of, I'm not sure if I can see it, minus 47. And here, where you don't have pockets, you have uh, plus about 72. And here's a control group, and they're about plus 74. And there's other data that supports this, namely that if you want to know whether a pocket is hot, you just put a strip of platinum, a platinum rod, you put it down into the pocket, and you measure it. We do that routinely. But I've had great difficulty trying to convince periodontists that this will tell you more than all of the other indices and so forth, whether you've got a hot pocket or not. OK, now I want to say a little bit about oxygen utilization, because you're going to see that I mentioned oxygen before, but it's a very important aspect to the EH. <clears throat> now, the PO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen, the oxygen level. And as this slide says here, the PO2 and the substrate types are key factors in determining the EH level. The substrate types is carbohydrate on the one hand or, those, or the amino acids on the other. And here's what we see. A few of the amino acids are crucial for lowering the EH. This is predominantly comes from saliva. It can come from curricular fluid and come from tissues, but the saliva is the major contributor. And it's the gram negatives that are responsible for that. Sugars, on the other hand, the gram positives will use the sugars, and they'll favor an elevation of EH. And here's the reason for it. With the sugars, you have what's called aerobic glycolysis which is essentially glycolysis in the presence of oxygen. And you form hydrogen peroxide. And that is good for raising the EH. And secondly, hydrogen peroxide, as you know, is also good for trying to 
hit at the gram negatives. The only trouble is that a lot of the bacteria in the mouth have very powerful catalase activity. And as a result, a lot of that gets converted to H2O and, and oxygen. This is fine for raising the EH, but bad for any products and so forth that try to use hydrogen peroxide. And one of the things that we found is that you have to get to a level of at least 1% and above of hydrogen peroxide to overcome this catalase barrier. And when you're able to do this, then you can get some benefits from the peroxide. But once you get up to 1%, it starts becoming irritating to the tissues. So the use of peroxide is pretty, is not a simple, simple process. So just to summarize a few of the things I've said here with regard to the amino acids, here's uh, what this slide basically, or let me take you through this slide. Okay, firstly, the cysteine and double cysteine is very important for reducing the EH. Secondly, the cysteine, double cysteine, methionine, tryptophan, arginine, and ornithine, they produce the odoriferous end products. And then it is proline, glutamate, ornithine, and arginine that stimulate oxygen consumption and they favor a lowering of the PO2. So now one can see why saliva plays a very significant role in the whole process of putting together some of the factors that are involved in, um, it, it, <coughs> that are in uh, both the oral malodor and the periodontitis process. But there's another thing, and that is that saliva favors or counters acidity. And acidity inhibits, whereas neutrality and alkalinity favor malodor production in gingivitis periodontitis. So the use of so saliva is a great protector, but it's also, if it's not properly understood, can also be quite harmful. Yes? We would expect clinically, in a, let's say a young patient that has poor plaque control, Correct. and a fair amount Correct. of decay to have some you know, mouth odor, and yet the implication here is that we, we shouldn't see that, or we shouldn't be, I mean, that shouldn't be. Well what, well, what you will find is that in the person, and this is a generalization, okay, where they tend to have more cavities, tend to be much more prone in that direction, are not the malodor problem. They, they're very, they're minor. And that's because of this, that the acidity will actually uh, inhibit. And that's why you actually, you, for example, in a lot of, uh, it's, it's a little bit tricky in that um, you may have some sites that are alkaline, some sites that are more acidic. So you couldn't be, you get odor from those. But it isn't just the sites, it's the tongue is also a big factor. But generally, the person who's more towards the caries direction does not have as much odor as the person who's more towards the alkalinity and the perio direction. Okay, now the oxidation reduction changes in the classical whole saliva malodor experiment. So let me just take you briefly through that. This is just a slide to show you that if you have uh, glucose, you tend to go, as well as the acidic direction, you also go, the EH goes up. Okay, in contrast, supernatant, it goes down. This is where neither is added. Here's where's the mixture of the two. Basically, sugars favor an elevation of EH, in contrast, to the amino acids in the saliva favors a lowering of EH. Okay. Now, the question is, what is it? And one of the things that we've done over the years is developed a variety of methods for being able to go in and try to find out what fraction is involved. And what we have found is that there are small peptides that are secreted in the saliva, which we've given the name salivary redoxin, which is important for lowering the EH, okay? And these are, um, are crucial for this, and what we have not studied is what the levels are in individuals with different malodor, different uh, periodontitis levels, but we think that this may be a crucial factor in why some people have more malodor than others and why are more prone to peri or not. If so, it does at least give an idea or, the, or gives the potential of being able perhaps to interfere with it. So now, but as a result of that, we've introduced what we, we call the concept of a critical EH. We're kind of stealing from the critical pH that's associated with dental caries. And there, as you know, when you use a sugar challenge, you get a drop in the pH. And those that give 
that show a larger drop in pH are those that are more caries prone in contrast to those that don't show as large who are more caries free or less caries active. So the question is, supposing you now carry this over to the whole idea of a critical EH. So here's what we have for the caries situation. Here's time, here's the sugar challenge. And you see here, this would be the person who is caries free, caries active, because there is a certain demineralization level that's possible. And that's what we see happening in this case, uh, exceeding or going below that level. And so we get the mineralization of the tooth. And here, we think that this is what's happening, that if we challenge with redoxin, that in the person who doesn't get the perio breakdown and gets minimal malodor, we will see that. In contrast to other individuals that give the greater drop, we will see a critical level where the tissues will break down and we will see the uh, problems associated with malodor and uh, perio. Time will tell, but hopefully, at maybe one of your later meetings, I may be able to be more specific on that. So here's a bit of a summary of that concept. The EH is the master variable for oral putrefaction and hence oral malodor and gingivitis periodontitis, just as pH is the master variable for demineralization, remineralization, and hence for dental caries and calculus formation. Calculus formation is where, of course, it goes uh, quite alkaline. So that's just for completeness. Okay, so that's what I've taken you through now has been basically to try to give you a bit of an idea of where the, some of the science is at. You're going to hear more and more about uh, oral putrefaction and about oral malodor and so forth. In fact, you're starting to hear more of it now. By and large, it's something that not too many people were doing much work in, but it's now becoming more and more uh, to the forefront. So what I, in the next series, I want to give you an idea of a little bit of the development in some of the methods that have been um, developed in order to do some of the research, but also in, will contribute to diagnostics and being able to deal with some of these um, aspects. And here, uh, this is periodontal disease treatment and monitoring. I'm not going to say too much about treatment. I'm just going to talk about the monitoring. Um, being able to see what the level is, the diagnostics, but important is monitoring, because if you don't monitor, you don't know whether what you're doing is working, and uh, that, of course, has been one of the most neglected aspects in a lot of, uh, of uh, clinical dentistry. Okay, the periodontal probe, well familiar with that. It's been used for the pocket depth. In clinical studies, particularly, it's used for measuring the calculus but it's also now being extended to be used for gingival recession. Um, the amount that you see, it's above the free uh, margin of the gingivae and whatever is below. And then the peritron has been used for measuring gingival periodontal fluid. It started out being called GCF, but it's also PPF as well, periodontal pocket fluid. And also for sampling for, uh, of the fluid for analysis. And then more recently has been the uh, appearance of the helimeter for measuring oral malodor. Helimeter from the name is to measure the breath, halos, okay? Okay, the first thing is the measurement of GCF and PPF, gingival curricular fluid and periodontal pocket fluid, okay? And GCF is basically a transidate which becomes an exudate and shows bleeding as the gingival inf inflammation increases in severity. Uh, there's, uh, it's now the, the number of papers that are involved in this area now must number at least in the several thousand. And this is just a reminder of where the inflammation is. Here's the plaque and the inflammation is here and it's only as this spreads that you can see it clinically, which is the free margin of the ginger. And in order to see what's going on in the crevice, Yorn, a number of years ago, introduced these tiny filter paper strips, inserted them into the crevice, and collected some of the fluid, and then stained it with um, anhydrin because there's amino acids and peptides and so forth there. And in this way, he could see how much fluid there was, and then he'd take a ruler and what have you and try to get some idea of how much area of the strip was covered, and that way get some idea of what the level of inflammation 
more recently, I'm sure quite of you are aware, the strips are now, uh, the fluid on strips is measured electronically. This just shows you first dry, completely on the outside. Here's what the strips look like. Uh, there's a strip being, uh, getting ready for insertion. Insertion, here's what the instrument looks like. Some of you may actually be using it. Here is put between the jaws and electronically measured. And this just shows you the relationship between the gingival index clinically and, and some of the readings. And this is a huge study that was done showing that relationship holds for different age groups, male, female, etc. And this is a, a, a significant slide that, was, um, that represents data showing years ago that here's the collagen, percent collagen that's in the gingivae, and here's the fluid level, the GCF level. And if the fluid, <coughs> if the fluid levels uh, are high, then the percentage of collagen fibers intact is low. And of course, if the fluid level is, is low, then of course, most of the collagen fibers are intact. And that's where that number about, before you can see it with your eyeball, uh, eyeballs, that 70% uh, or so of the collagen has already been destroyed. Here's a very recent and very important observation that was made recently by uh, Dr. Golub, who is formerly at Manitoba and who is with me at Stony Brook. And that is where the, um, when collagenase starts to appear in the curvicular fluid, then that is when the cold pocket, the gingivitis, becomes the periodontitis. And at a reading of about 40 of GCF, which incidentally translates to 0.2 microliters, at that point, the collagenase starts to appear, and, ginger, and the epithelial attachment starts to move apically. So we now know that about this sort of level, if you have curvicular fluid levels that are above values like so, you've got a pocket where destruction is very likely to be taking place. Now, I think we switch to the other. Um, Are there any questions while he's changing the... Yes? Is this the stuff with the control against vitamin C? It sounds like you're just talking about, you know, beginning of the surgery, how does it break down? Um, well, the thing is, there are, you still get the breakdown where individuals do not have a vitamin C deficiency problem. Um, it does not mean that if you have, uh, if you've got everything exactly the same, the same microbial challenge, and you've got uh, a different host resistance factor, that you won't see greater breakdown with this greater host, uh, um, less host resistance factor, which could be the case where you do have a vitamin C deficiency. Uh, but the microbial attack is so overpowering in most individuals that the others are of lesser importance. But that does not mean there isn't a very significant segment of individuals where that will be a factor. So you're talking about host resistance. Okay. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, as a clinician, one of the reasons that I've been reluctant to get involved with these kinds of diagnostic tests is because besides what you're talking here about is measuring of the curricular fluid, there are systems for measuring the, the, the pocket temperature, measuring the kinds of bacteria, the DNA, and each one is claiming that Correct. their system can be diagnostic of whether or not a pocket is likely to be active and breaking down. That's correct. Given, there seems to be no consensus yet as to which one works the best or which one actually is effective in, in making a diagnosis. Well, firstly, on the temperature side, if you use thermistors, what you discover is you're looking for a fraction of a percent in terms of any of the thermal changes, and the methods are extremely variable. And incidentally, the thing is, is that um, the thing is, look at what some of the publications are. Okay. Um, can you hear me, or am I back too far? Okay. Are we all right? Your perio temp, yes. Years ago, we, uh, we've done a lot of work with thermistors, and it's so variable, you don't even touch it. Okay, so that's what on that. Your other question was with regard to DNA probes, etc., and so forth. Okay, um, 
the problem with the DNA probes is that it's very difficult for you to go ahead and do many sites because of cost factors. And the other thing, which is the more significant factor, is the fact that it isn't just one microorganism that's responsible. It isn't one gram negative that's responsible. So as a consequence, you see, one of the things that has taken place over the last 20, 30 years has been, there has been a deluge largely pushed by NIDR, National Institute of Dental Research, that dental caries is an infectious disease caused by strep mutans, which I could go into a whole lecture on here, which is a lot of nonsense because it's a minor organism, believe it or not. The numbers are not enough to cause the dental caries, and there's plenty of others that'll give just as much acid. And on the perio side of it, they've tried to say that it's P. gingivalis in particular that is the causative organism. You take out P. gingivalis, and plenty of the others will give you perio disease, and that's been demonstrated in animals and what have you. And that just goes on and on, and the literature is deluged with it. But basically, um, you'll start to get some semblance of sanity when the conventional wisdom changes. That's one of the reasons why you have difficulty when it comes to trying to change views, just like people going through school are taught about amalgams and try and change the views. But to answer your question, it is really, it's really difficult when you've got a whole pile of different things that are, but if you take a look at what the data is, and, and you'll see it's actually pretty weak. It's over 20 years, and it's had its struggle to, to, uh, to convince. If you think amalgams are a problem, you ought to see what it's like to convince people to use diagnostics, period. And curricular fluid is just an example of that. There was a hand I think I saw up there. Yes? Softness and hardness. Let, let me tell you a classic. Okay. Um, there's more. There's more related to the soft and hard than it is to the sugar and non-sugar. Okay. Uh, and let me tell you what that is. Quite a few years ago, um, the Mellon bees. They were involved with vitamin D discoveries way back. Ran a very key experiment where they took ferrets, two groups. One group. They gave meat that was on the bone, left on the little pieces of bone, and the other case where they were separated. And the ones that had it on the bone did not get the periodontal disease, and the ones that, where it was just separated from the bone uh, did. And in, in modern times, when you want to develop periodontal disease in animal models, you, you give them a soft diet. So there does definitely seem to be a factor, and whether it's removing a plaque or something beyond that, uh, that part is not really studied extensively, but that, so there is something definitely different in the two, okay? Okay, now here's the periodontal probe that we've all been exposed to, and this is it being inserted, and so you can get some idea of how much damage has been done. There you see calculus, of course, okay? And the periodontal probe has been used uh, by uh, the Volpe manhole team over the years, used in clinical studies, and what happens is you just simply place it relative to the tartar, three different sites, uh, in three different positions, and then you work out a score from that. And more recently, and, and of course that's been used and used a lot in clinical studies to see whether or not there's any effect. In this case, it's a tartar control rinse, and here's with the rinse and there without the rinse, and so it's been used in clinical studies. And here you have, where you have, um, here's the um, a cement to enamel junction, free margin of the gingivae, so you got some recession here, which is the visible portion, and then the portion that's below, um, which is the not visible or the hidden. And you can use the periodontal probe in the same sort of way 
where you make the, the three directional measurements like so for the portion that's above and here for below and you get a score. In other words, basically what you're able to do is even with these relatively simple devices, and this is used in clinical studies and, and uh, are quite, uh, quite reliable. Okay, now, measurement of malodor, here's what the halimeter looks like. When you get the instrument, you'll see a straw that comes out of here. We had to change some of the electronics and some of the, uh, the uh, mouthpiece device. It gives us more stability. This shows where it's just gonna be placed uh, into the mouth. And all one does is just allow the pump to just pull a little bit of a, a sample of breath. And, um, and uh, the instrument is basically a uh, sulfide electrode, which in turn assesses predominantly hydrogen sulfide and some methyl mercaptan, but predominantly hydrogen sulfide. And, and this shows a, a correlation uh, between a panel and the uh, parts per billion of uh, VSC. And uh, the correlation isn't too bad. It's not too bad. But you're gonna find a fair number of individuals that uh, will show uh, uh, very little uh, VSC but still have odor, and that's because a lot of it is the endoskatol and some of the other components. This is another simple way whereby what you do is you take an ordinary glass rod, and you got your saliva sample, this person from, from the patient that spit into a tube, you put the glass rod in, we usually do three times, take a sniff, and you get pretty good at the different kinds of odors. It's something worth uh, developing a little bit of expertise. For, for the, um, for your, you can try this with yourselves, but you can also with subjects or your patients, you can teach them. The, um, we jokingly refer to this as the uh, uh, Mel Rosenberg uh, back of the hand licking test. Uh, a bit like when a dog licks you, well, you do this in your own privacy. And, and the three times lick of the back of the hand and then you um, just sniff at intervals. It takes a little while for a little bit of the uh, water to come off, and then you start sniffing some of the different odors and what have you. And again, you get pretty good at it, and the intensity you can tell, and uh, it will vary according to uh, hygiene and other things and so forth. And you'll be surprised at the number of individuals with superb hygiene that still have the odor, because the tongue is not easy to clean, and uh, it's just not easy to achieve it. Um, okay. In vivo, the oral malodor generation depend upon the um, volatilization ability, and that's why saliva comes in. And saliva is very, uh, very much a problem in individuals that get older. There's the old business of collecting the amount of spit by just spitting into tubes and so forth. This is a special type of a, um, well, here's just simply a funnel uh, going into a test tube, but now there's a device where you can do resting and the stimulated in, in like a split device. It's really a split funnel, and um, one side is for resting, the other one is stimulated, and it's jokingly referred to as the splatoon. So, but basically, it, it's a, it's commercially called the sialometer. Um, now, the measurement of the moisture level. These are special strips that have been developed that you put against the palate because an extensive, actually a couple of very extensive studies have demonstrated that the driest part is the heart palate. Lips come next, but the driest part of the mouth is the heart palate. And uh, the difference between the person who shows dryness and the person who does not, or the symptoms of dryness and those who do not, is only a difference between like 10 microns as compared to something like uh, uh, 17, 18, 20, something like that. But you can very precisely do this by taking these strips and going back to measuring these tiny volumes with the peritron. So you can use it for that as well. Now the pH is the result of the acid-base metabolism which I've gone through before. It's important for calculus, but it also gives you an idea uh, whether or not it's favoring the gingivitis perio. And you can take these strips, and these are these are your, this is your standard scale, and this is the active region, and you just take an ordinary cotton applicator, and you can put it in the sample of saliva that's been collected, or have the patient just simply collect saliva in the floor of their mouth, roll it in that, get it nice and wet, and then what you do, you see, in this case, alkaline, you see, you do that in a matter of just a, a minute or so. Um, 
I know some of the individuals uh, on Long Island that are using this, they're getting paid for it by third party payment. So uh, now another thing that's being, uh, that is um, very important is the measurement of the EH. And that you can do uh, with the uh, platinum electrode. It's a very simple process, but I don't have a slide for it. But I'll show you something else that's being used. This is being used by some of the Japanese in which um, they're actually using dyes. Just like you use a disclosing solution, you can use redox dyes. And there's a mixture of methylene blue and TTC, which is triphenyl tetrazolium chloride. And here is uh, when you the mix, and you got this bluish color, which is fine because this is the form for the, um, when uh, methylene blue is in the oxidized form, then you have this bluish color. So here you're going to get probably something like about a plus 40 or something like that. In contrast, you see here, you see the red, which is due to the TTC. And here you're probably about minus 100 or something like that. So with rinses like this, you can get some idea of where a person's mouth is at. Now, basically, um, the message I really want to get across, besides giving you the science and so forth, is really that um, if you can measure, then you can manage the disease. If you can't measure, you can't manage the disease. And so I've taken you through a whole variety of different the, the, the parameters. And so here, here's the, essentially, if I'm going to give, provide any kind of a message, it's basically this. That basically, what research methods do is they really are the precursors of the diagnostic methods that ultimately get used in clinic care. The, the key difference between the two is in the first case, when you're trying to get the knowledge, you don't care how long it takes and what it costs and so forth. And ultimately, when it gets translated to simplicity and low costs, and, and if you can get a third party to pay for it and so forth, then it'll get used. And this is an area that's emerging. But I'll tell you, it's not emerging very fast. We've been at this for years. And essentially, one of the things why we have got into this years ago is because, and I'm convinced, is that you can't get changes in clinical dentistry until this is part of the curriculum. And uh, even though we've gotten this as part of guidelines and so forth and what have you, we're probably one of the few places in the country at Stony Brook where this is part of the requirements the students learn and what have you. And basically, it's an emerging new discipline. hope it's in my lifetime, but anyway. Um, but what's very important, and this is the message I wanted to get across to this organization, I do not believe you're going to get a new kind of oral medicine until you have those methods. And if we look at, at medicine per se, we take a look. What do you find? Roughly, you got the two branches. Surgery, okay, and then medicine. Each of them has their tools. Dentistry has the surgery part. It's got its tools. It's got its diagnostic tools there, which are essentially determining how much damage has been done. What's that? The x-ray, the periodontal probe, okay? Now we look at, in medicine, we look at the medicine side. Those are the diagnostic methods that involve, whether it's blood analyses or, or uh, challenge tests uh, like for diabetes and so forth. And dentistry has been deficient in that. And until you do that, you can't get at the early stages of disease conditions. And you can't really do monitoring where you're able to deal with things in the early stages. And I believe that that's where there's a major deficiency in dentistry. And until one takes care of that, that is why uh, things take so long. These are the prevalent oral conditions that, uh, that you see in substantial amounts in patients, caries, sensitive teeth. Surprisingly, dentists don't even recognize it, even though surveys show that it's 15 to 20 percent of individuals. And of course, calculus, these collectively are the demineralization, remineralization, gingivitis, perio, oral malodor. Oral malodor is now starting to take off. Why? Because there's big money in it. And with the coming of the HAL limiter and so forth, this is now looked at now as being the million dollar practice. And that's why it's going to take off. And then dry mouth affects 30% of the population, 50% uh, of those over age 50. And most of it is caused by medical medication, most of it. 
about 85% of it. Tremendous number of, of individuals affected by it, and it's been largely ignored. And people talk, and have been talking about the emergence of, of the oral physician. I do not believe that the oral physician will emerge until you've got the methods and the technology that's associated with that, even though it's badly needed. And my final slide is there are um, two terms that we've, we're hearing about. This one now has become very popular, and you hear of it in business and politics and so forth. So this is actually uh, being accelerated, etc. But knowledge transfer, you hear of it in academic, but it is still a major hurdle. And if the dental students are taught, if they are taught, whatever they're taught is what will determine for the bulk of them what they're going to do in practice. And that is the place uh, that is the tough part to try to change. Whoops, I think I have just one last slide. And the reasons for using diagnostic procedures, some of them are obvious, system making the diagnosis and deciding which treatments to use. That's fine, but here's important. The monitoring, the progression, or the regression of the disease. How do you know if something is working or not? Okay. And assessing the effectiveness of the treatment. How do you know if it's working or not? So this is where the diagnostics comes in, and that is related very closely to understanding what's going on, to knowing the science. And uh, that's the end of what I, the end of my slides. Thank you. If there's any questions. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to. Yes. Yeah. Have, you, have you done any work with the relationship of pocket formation and uh, oral galvanism from the metallic restoration? Uh, I personally have not, but there has, um, there has been reported, uh, and this goes back a few years, that um, uh, when you compare curricular fluid levels, in, in, uh, where you have restorations present and where you don't have the curricular fluid levels and the inflammation is higher. Now, some of that will be because of um, um, physical irritation, etc. but nobody has really studied whether or not uh, the, um, in that regard, whether or not the uh, restorations per se have done much damage. So basically, but it's, it's, it's an area that could be studied with regard to whether it's amalgams or what have you. But there's no question that if you take patients, bring them in, and you go ahead and look where you have restorations and where you do not have restorations, and you look at the health of the, of the tissues, um, pretty different. It's not as good where the restorations are. And that's why there's been individuals that advocate bringing those margins above the gingery. You know, there was a, there was a big debate, just like we talk about amalgam wars and these other wars and so forth. There have been other kinds of wars. There's been where do you place the, you know, the, the gingival margin of restorations? Should you put it below or above the gingery? And as a result of these kind of things, uh, some argue very strongly being above. And because you now have the fluoride to help with the carry side, it's been less of a problem than it used to be. But it's a whole area that I think that could be studied more intensively. Yes? I guess you're... <clears throat> See, they gave you the defective one. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm a physician. I'm right. Not Where are you getting your saliva specimens for pH? You can, you can do saliva measurements and either outside the mouth or you can do it inside the mouth. If you can do it inside the mouth, the best place to take it is in the floor of the mouth, just behind the lower incisors. And that correlates very well with the specimen that you collect, which you collect by letting people just dribble out of their mouth. And the reason for the high correlation is because of the fact that the bulk, about 70, 75% of the saliva and whole saliva comes from the submandibular sublinguals and that is what comprises the biggest chunk of it. So if you want to do it in, in vivo, you want it in the mouth, you just do, you let, uh, let the individual just let it collect, 
in the floor of the mouth, and a lot of it pools there anyways, and then just put your cotton applicator there. Uh, are you familiar with the work of Dr. Paul Wright from Calgary, right. who uses saliva pH as a way of judging the general acid base of the body rather than both? Um, I don't know what the details of, of his be, but I've heard of his name. Um, but the saliva pH in the mouth, in the floor of the mouth, does correlate with the saliva pHs that are on the oral surfaces. There have been, through the years, attempts to relate the saliva pH, um, usually from a collected sample. And with regard to... Um, body pH, whichever, whatever one means by that, because, you know, that's a little bit, you know, that can mean a lot of things. And the major problem with many of those studies is that the collection of saliva, although it appears simple, believe it or not, is very difficult. And the reason why it's difficult is that, firstly, you, you have to bring your um, subjects or patients in under fasting conditions, do them all at the same time in the morning, because you don't want the influence of food and there's, there's a circadian rhythm associated with it. So what you have to do is bring them under a very standard condition. And then what you have to do is you have to sit them for at least 20 minutes to an hour to make sure there are no uh, psychological factors, rushing up the stairs and all this sort of thing and so forth. And then you have to collect it without any kind of force. And that, if you don't do that, there are very large errors. So um, he, he obviously is got his hands full because many people have tried this over the years. Now, I would suggest he might consider if he's collecting it, I'm assuming that he's collecting it by the sample that, that people are giving, is to consider doing this kind of uh, measurement in the floor of the mouth. And he avoids a lot of problems when he does that. I've been doing this now for a number of years. Right. Just ask patients to be a couple hours after Field. Sure. We have them basically cleanse their tongue with, you know, with their teeth and sure. swallow honey saliva and then right. forcibly express a fresh saliva and bring it to their lips. Uh, I have find, found it a, a very predictable tool. People are eating high sugar diet, they are acid. Right. Uh, when they are deficient in vitamin D, uh, clinically or by measurement, they're acid, and when they're eating a uh, general lousy diet, and sure. we get a, a change in a, in a matter of weeks, this change in diet, so that I, I feel that there is something about the fresh saliva that, that is a reflection of the body status and the saliva in the uh, well, <clears throat> well, well your, 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 your perceptions, your impressions are not wrong because what one sees is that in individuals who end up with um, hyposalivation, xerostomia, etc., you see very dramatic effects and that's largely because of the medications and so forth that I referred to. Okay. And in those cases, it's not too difficult to see that there has been changes and what have you. And um, routinely, we now, believe it or not, we now have our students with their restorative cases and so forth. They must. They can't proceed now. I think we're probably the only school in the country, but they cannot proceed with any of their restorative work or what have you until they've done certain saliva assessments. And one of those includes flow rate, the pH, and also um, the, uh, the, the uh, lactobacilli, not because of whether lactobacilli are the cause it carries, but as an index of the carbohydrate in their diet and so forth. Now, those are, that's done as part of the routine, and um, the methods are much better than now. Now, the reason I mention that is that when you do them, I mean, what you're doing, there's nothing wrong with it. But I would suggest that you want to um, tighten up some of the methods because of all of the history associated with this. 
one of the things you may want to try is just what I showed you here, which is the floor of the mouth. If you want to get the saliva where it's, um, it's a nice sample and you can get the pH of it and uh, it'll correlate with the general acidity in the mouth, which reflects the plaque and everything else and so forth. But generally, if a person has a lower saliva flow and if that person um, uh, has a lower saliva flow, they also have a uh, lower pH. And let me tell you an actual experience that we have. When we teach the students, and we don't have large class sizes, we've, we've been around 30, but now they're making us work harder, we're up to about 40. But anyway, so the thing is, what we do as an exercise is we do this very simple test that I've shown you here, and we pick up in every single class we pick up individuals that are on one end very acidic and the other end that are very alkaline. And then where we say, okay, now that you've, we, we've, for those individuals, they then would get studied further. So what, what I was gonna suggest, keep doing what you're doing, but if you, if you write to me, I'll tell you where you can get some of these strips, okay, so you can just try them and try them along with the same, the same thing that you're doing. And you might be very pleasantly surprised. You may find it easier and more, more accurate. Okay. Thank you. Okay? Yes. Are, are there accepted insurance codes for third parties for this plan? It's, uh, I find that I personally am not involved with that, but I do get people that talk to me about it. Leo Sreedney at our school who does it does a lot of this through the medical side of things. He gets third party payment, no problems. Uh, Mark Wolf, who incidentally, he's the one that's the head of our restorative, he has ways where I forget what code he puts it under. And I think for saliva tests, you can, I think you can get with some insurance carriers. Um, it just reminds me of something I, I should have mentioned, in fairness, is that Mark Wolf's the head of restorative, but he also happens to be a student of mine, and so he's been indoctrinated. So that's why I think we finally have gotten it so that, you know, it's routine. But basically, I think what has to happen more and more is pushing for third-party payment for things, and then they'll get done. A lot of the curricular fluid people that, who do get paid by third-party do it through, the, through the microbiology. On the carriers thing, the microbiology is no problem. So it depends on the carriers, and uh, there's absolutely no reason why one shouldn't be pushing for these. And then I, I predict it will, it will be done far more routinely, Hope, hopefully not badly. Any other? Yes. Uh, antioxidants and free radicals uh, are, is a major uh, area in uh, biomedicine today. Uh, have you studied uh, anything about the local antioxidant status in the environment? is that, well, it depends on um, what you're going to include into the reactive oxygen category. Peroxide, certainly, there's been a lot done with that and the barrier that I mentioned. Um, when it comes to whether it's uh, superoxides uh, or some of the others, um, that is, um, it's not easy to set up models 
uh, as far as the mouth is concerned. It's not, a, not easy to do them in situ. There's samples that are taken and what have you. There's, there's the uh, oxygen bursts that are done with you know, the PMNs. Um, those certainly take place. But as far as anything that is really solid, um, it's not in the same category as, say, the peroxides in some of these other areas. And you, uh, you also have a lot of interactions amongst the bacteria where um, they have the means to remove some of these reactive molecules. So it, it's, it's, it's not an easy area to really get you know, good solid data. And, and as far as vitamin C is concerned, there have been, you know, vitamin C has been studied very extensively, but it's very difficult to be definitive with it with, uh, because a lot of things, are, unless it's very, very large effects, it's very difficult to do uh, with, uh, with the mouth. I don't know if I've answered your question. Well, well yeah, but it's, it's one thing to do. Well, it depends on what specifically you're going to measure and how you're going to sample it. I'm looking at it from an experiment standpoint. It's not, people have tried this. Yes, yes, you can, but the, but the, you see the, <sighs> just think, you see, what some of the, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, there's a lot that's ripe there with regard to, because of the very sharp drops in the EH that you get, and exactly what it is that's responsible for the, um, for the sharp drop in the EH is intimately involved with this, and that's not been defined. So it makes it very difficult to know what the heck it is you have to go after. Yes? You mentioned uh, annual curricular fluid a number of times. I'm not clear. Is it, is it the presence or lack of presence of the annual curricular fluid that has clinical significance, or is it really measurements of the pH within the fluid that we're looking at? No, it's the, it's the actual presence and the amount that's present. In other words, individuals that, are, that have exceptionally good hygiene will show zero fluid or close to zero fluid. It's actually the level which is diagnostic. The, the, the pH is uh, for, for the periodontal side of things is that generally it is more alkaline, but the problem is that when you get into the curricular um, area, and because of bleeding in that, that will tend to buffer it. So it's a little bit tricky. It's not as definitive as when you're doing it with plaque itself. 